This is episode 168 of That Shakespeare Life. Shakespeare history, the phrase appeared at court or performed at court frequently gets used to describe what Shakespeare was doing at various points of his life. However, the political complexities and variances between reigning monarchs of England can make it hard to visualize exactly what it means to go to court, especially if you don't first understand what court is, who goes there, or why do they go there? So this week, we've set out to rectify this gap in knowledge with our guest, Natalie Mears, who is here to share her research into courts, courtiers, and culture for Tudor England, an article which she published in the historical journal back in 2003. In that paper, Natalie cites a play by Thomas Norton and Thomas Sackville called Gorbaduk that was performed in 1561 to 1562 at court. And that play is an example of how performances were used to not only comment on events of the day by performance, similar to what you might think of today as an editorial cartoon. But in the case of Gorbaduk, the play commented directly to Elizabeth I to try and influence her decision to marry and to comment on Robert Dudley as a potential candidate. Natalie's work goes on to cite sermons selected by James VI and I to scold the Scottish Presbyterians at Hampton Court in 1606, as well as a sermon by Edward Daring in 1570 that, quote, lambasted the queen for perceived failures at political reform. These examples have us wondering if the instances of Shakespeare appearing at court were more than just event entertainment. Were plays like Shakespeare's similar political weapons in the same way as Gorbaduk? Would Shakespeare's plays have been brought to court for their power to influence politics? And if so, does that explain why Shakespeare wrote so frequently about political issues? Natalie Mears joins us today to answer some of these questions about Shakespeare and court life and to make the case that court life was Shakespeare's social media. And through his appearances there, the bard may have been a 16th century social influencer. Natalie Mears is an associate professor at Durham University. Her interest in the Elizabethan period began before she went to university where she worked in the archives at Hatfield House, where the papers of Lord Burley, the principal secretary and Lord Treasurer to Elizabeth, and his son are kept. She did her undergraduate degree at Cambridge, followed by a master's and PhD at St. Andrews under John Guy. She was published extensively on Elizabeth, Elizabethan politics and religion, the Tudors, James VI and I, and religious worship. She is currently working on a new book on Elizabeth, influenced by the Me Too and Black Lives Matter movement. You can find out more about Natalie and links to her work in the show notes for today's episode. Hello, Natalie. Welcome to the show. Hello, Cassidy. Um, thanks very much for inviting me. It's lovely to be here. Explain for us, what is a court? Okay, so that actually is a much more complicated question to answer than you probably think. <laughs> and that's because it's it's a mixture of sort of people, institutions and places. And then also typically historians don't agree on it. So let me unkind of pack it for you. So I think all historians would agree that the court at the very least is the royal household, which I'll explain a bit more about in a moment. Members of the aristocracy and gentry who are who don't have sort of like official positions in the royal household, but are there visiting. And then things like foreign ambassadors. Um, there's also this kind of spatial element in that at the very least, it would be the royal palace in which the monarch is residing um, at that time. Um, to unpack that even further though, um, the, the royal household um, so it, it comprises of the above stairs um, part, which is known as the chamber, and that looks after all the kind of monarch's needs. It kind of looks after the monarch. And part of that is what's known as the privy chamber, which is the monarch's kind of private lodgings. And so in terms of people, um, the chamber is run by um, the Lord Chamberlain and a Vice Chamberlain. And the kinds of people we will have there are 
ladies of the bedchamber, if we're thinking about Elizabeth, um, ladies in waiting, um, various other kinds of officials, gentlemen, ushers, guards, etc. There's then the below stairs bit, that's kind of like the kitchens. And we would count that as part of the court simply because it allows the above stairs part to function, but we would never think of those people as courtiers. And then there's also the stables, again, um, that, that allows the court to function. We wouldn't think of that as courtiers, with the exception of the master of the horse who is in charge of the stables. And that's because that's a very kind of prominent position that has um, kind of quite a co close connection or relationship with the Queen. And indeed, under Elizabeth, that position is held by the Earl of Leicester. Um, so you know, definitely a courtier. Um, as I said, we then have members of the aristocracy and gentry who might not have jobs at the court, but come and visit and sort of hang around. Now, the real complication sort of comes when you want to kind of define the outer boundaries of the court. Um, and that's because um, people who have jobs at court, as well as members of the gentry and aristocracy, are not necessarily at the court all the time. And so some historians have argued that you therefore need to include the places where they are even when they're not at court in a sense. So that would mean um, their houses in London, um, their houses out in the country. And because of that kind of connection between sort of people who are sort of connected at the court, but are not physically in the Royal Palace, um, some historians also include the inns of court as part of the court. And this I think is perhaps of kind of relevance um, for Shakespeare. And the reason why they include the Inns of Court is partly because it's a sort of springboard for some people to enter royal service, but also because the Inns of Court around Christmas and New Year have quite an important role in um, drama. And some of the plays and entertainments which are put on at the Inns of Court sort of transfer to the Royal Court. Was this an official governing body of selected people? So did these members get together at a typical, like a typical court session, for example, or is this held quarterly or annually? When do these people gather together to be, you know, okay, court is being held now? Okay, so the court is always, if you like, in session because it's, it's the monarch's household. And so um, much of the court is actually just tending to the monarch's living needs. In terms of government, though, it does include the Privy Council, and that is the main governing body in terms of sort of politics, foreign policy, domestic policy. So the Privy Council um, uh, meets regularly. Um, by the end of Elizabeth's reign, it's meeting virtually every day. It um, is made up of privy councillors and they tend to be um, people who are particularly close to the monarch. So um, they might have official positions um, in the chamber or the privy chamber. Um, they might be members of the aristocracy. Um, and, and that's what meet, that's what kind of qualifies them kind of for being at the, the Privy Council. And I think just the other thing is that Elizabeth also, um, and James the sixth and first to a lesser extent, also takes advice and discusses things with people outside the Privy Council. So it's kind of, the Privy Council is at the center, if you like, of government, um, but the court is a kind of broader forum um, for it. Natalie ha alluded a minute ago to the Earl of Leicester, but she writes about Robert Dudley, known perhaps more now for his relationship with Elizabeth I. He was one of what Natalie calls the, quote, newly established courtier nobles, end quote. At least one researcher suggests that, quote, that let Lester's clientele not only gave him an important role in local politics, but may also have been more important in establishing his claims to a prominent position at court than his close personal relationship with Elizabeth, end quote. Natalie, 
who was in charge of selecting the court nobles? I had thought it would have been the queen or king of England. And this description makes it sound like courtiers themselves had significant power over who was in attendance. So who chose who gets to be a member at court? Now, you're right, Cassidy, it is the monarch, um, whether that's the king or queen. Um, they have the final say or they're doing the kind of appointing of people. So anyone who has an official job at the court ultimately is employed, if you like, by the monarch. And it's those jobs are actually often given out um, to the monarch's relatives, to their friends, um, the people that they like um, and, and actually want to have around them looking after them. When someone was called to appear at court, like we read about this a lot with William Shakespeare, he was called to appear at court. Is, does that function something like a jury summons? Um, not quite. Um, the court does actually have a judicial element to it. There is a legal court that is part of the royal court called Star Chamber, and that could actually haul people up in front of it, um, you know, at will. Um, but generally, no, you're being kind of um, ordered or asked, asked to, to attend um, for a particular reason. Um, so, for instance, um, in terms of drama, um, it, there would be a series of entertainments going on and different acting companies would be asked to you know, put on a particular play or something. Was a court gathering also a, an occasion for entertainment? Yes, it was. Um, when the court is in its kind of usual royal palaces, that kind of, the sort of big entertainment will take place um, around Christmas and New Year, very traditional time for plays and masks. In addition, when the court is on progress, so that is when Elizabeth is travelling around parts of the country, that's also an opportunity for other forms of um, entertainment, um, sort of plays, masks, um, uh, displays of local um, trades and weaving, um, pageants and, and things like that. Entertainment also does continue on a more, if you like, daily basis um, in the court, but that's much more sort of low key things um, such as sort of music or, or perhaps dancing. So who was it that coordinated bringing the entertainment to the court? And if someone like Shakespeare was called to go there, did he automatically know where he was supposed to show up? So um, the court entertainments are uh, partly organised um, by the Lord Chamberlain um, because he's sort of in charge of the court. There's also a, also a master of revels um, and um, he's also in charge of putting on drama. Um, he also has a role um, in sort of um, censoring or licensing plays that are being performed outside the court. In terms of Shakespeare's knowledge of where the court was, um, yes, he probably would know, providing he was in London. Um, we have to remember that at this time, London is tiny. It is actually the equivalent of what we call now the city of London. So it's about a square mile um, uh, in, in sort of um, size. And Westminster, so for instance, where Westminster Abbey is, that's a separate place. Um, and things like St. Martin's in the Fields is called St. Martin's in the Fields because it's in the fields. And that's nowadays right next to Trafalgar Square, what we'd really think of as central London. So London itself is very small, very densely populated, but there's loads of kind of rumour and gossip around. And people are very interested in the court and the queen and what's going on so there'd be lots of kind of gossip and rumor going around there are sort of if you like designated places in london where if you wanted to know what the news was you could go um so um 
you'd get particularly you go to St Paul's Cathedral and go to the churchyard um, at particular times of day and that's when people would kind of walk around and exchange um, a sort of gossip and rumour so yeah he would he would really know where the court is um, and when the court travels um, even if the monarch is moving from one palace sort of in and around London to another it was traditional for parishes to ring their bells as the monarch passed through um, their parish so you'd really get alerted um, to the monarch being on the move. In her work Natalie calls attention to Thomas Norton and Thomas Sackville's play called Gorbaduk that was performed at court in the early 1560s to comment directly to Elizabeth I on the situation with Dudley and a potential marriage. We have similar instances of sermons being selected under James VI and I to comment towards the people on politics and other sermons aimed at Elizabeth that Natalie writes were designed specifically to quote, lambast the queen for her decisions. Natalie, assuming we can put sermons and plays into the same category of public performance, can we conclude from these examples that plays like like Shakespeare's were used as political weapons? Um, first of all, yes, we definitely need to think of plays and sermons as performances. The um, point of plays is, yes, partly entertainment, but along with sermons, there is also a really important kind of um, persuasive element to them. And so to persuade your audience, you really do need to engage with them. So you do need to kind of perform and... Um, so even if you're a preacher, you can't just stand there droning on for several hours. You do need to really engage the audience. So, yes, performances, definitely. Um, in terms of um, uh, plays and sermons as some sort of, sort of political communication, um, I think that there are two sorts uh, or two ways we could categorise them. Um, First of all, there are the really obvious kind of advising or criticising ones that you've um, alluded to. And then there are also ones which kind of examine um, or explore issues of particular politics or religion um, a little bit more generally, um, perhaps not quite so specifically, perhaps not in relation to something that's going on there and now. Um, that isn't kind of a, a hot topic um, at the time. Um, and I think I should probably just add that though there are some um, sermons in particular that lambasted um, the Queen, notably Edward Deering's, where he basically called her a silly cow. Um, on the whole, um, uh, you couldn't really get away with that. And in fact, Deering never preached a call after that. <laughs> um, really, um, uh, one, one of her favourite preachers said that the best way he knew of criticising the Queen was by praising her. So you sort of say lots of nice things and the idea is that she clicks, that mm, I'm, I'm not kind of quite like that. Um, and it's, it's sort of more of a, like a model to live up to. Was it to Shakespeare's benefit to design plays that would be attractive to court members looking for performances they can use politically in this way. I think of things like Richard II was a major one that had political uses, but I wonder if that's a reason there are so many political issues in Shakespeare's plays overall. Richard II is a really good example because Elizabeth um, apparently um, uh, uh, turned to an ambassador um, either a play of Richard II or perhaps it was another one, but she did turn to an ambassador at one point and say, Basically, you know, this is all about me. Elizabeth um, could really read into things. So William Cecil, for instance, sort of says that she she sees things in plays that nobody else possibly would. That said, I would say that Shakespeare's main audience is a public audience outside the court. But that still explains why so many of his plays deal with, deal with political issues, because people were really, really interested in them. And plays were a really important way of exploring those issues. And there are a lot of kind of um, sort of difficult issues around sort of 
1590s and into the, the early 1600s. So things about the succession, um, about the nature of monarchy. Um, and so those are things that lots of people are interested in. And so, um, it, you know, he's, he's working primarily for, if you like, a commercial market. And so that, that market, that's what they're interested in. In her article, Natalie cites one researcher, David Starkey, who calls attention to the role of, quote, social networks in Tudor politics, end quote. We like to think that with the advent of Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, that the influence of social networks on society and the concept of, quote, canceling someone through public humiliation or swaying politics through social communication is a new global phenomenon resulting from the digital age and the wide reach of the internet. However, Natalie, when we look at your research and that of David Starkey to explore the history of court life, is it fair to say that court life was the 16th century version of a social network like Facebook? Um, yes and no. So um, this is a um, 16th and early 17th century England um, is, is a nation that has very, very limited bureaucracy. There's very limited kind of government infrastructure. So in order to get things done, you have to rely on a social network. Um, so a kind of a network of friends and family and um, people who are um, if you like, prepare to do things for you so that you, as a monarch, you can get your orders out into the country, but also then you can find out what's going on in the country, um, that you can use these people to help maintain law and order and things like that. So it's got that kind of um, Facebook kind of ha how many friends have you got um, uh, kind of element. Um, there's not, there's also quite quite a lot of kind of gossip and rumor going around. Um, um, whether or not we, we would have a kind of a sort of canceling and humiliating um, element to all of this, I'm, I'm less sure. Honor, status, reputation were really important. Um, and, you know, there are, you know, there are rumors going around all the time about Elizabeth. Um, you know, having children, etc. Um, and it's really important to maintain your honour and reputation. <clears throat> but I don't really think people were, if you like, deliberately humiliating um, others, um, uh, just to kind of get one over on them. When exploring how individuals presented themselves at court, Natalie cites Stephen Greenblatt's definition of, quote, self-fashioning, where he says, quote, individuals consciously constructed and presented a persona for their own ends, which did not always match reality, end quote. Natalie, this description of court life sounds very similar to what we think of as an influencer on Instagram today, where there's an intentionality about being flashy and wanting to get noticed by people in power who can not only talk well about you, but broker potentially lucrative connections for you. When Shakespeare was going to court with his plays, was he doing that intentionally to be the 16th century version of a social influencer? Was it to the benefit of Shakespeare to appear at court? Self-fashioning has similarities to that idea of um, social influencing. It's about creating a persona. It's less about being noticed, but about living up um, to an ideal. And it's important for us as historians or literary scholars, because it helps us actually understand the evidence. It helps us read between the lines um, rather than um, thinking that everyone's being, if you like, very transparent and what they're saying about themselves is true, um, that actually they might be creating this persona. However, that self-fashioning is different from being noticed and um, sort of the kind of patronage broking um, that you, you were talking about. Because if you like, the country is run on social networks, it is important to be part of those social networks and I guess get noticed in that sense. Um, it helps you, um, you know, might get a position at court, it might help you um, in sort of marriage negotiations, you know, when you're trying to marry your son or daughter to someone. Um, but the people who, if you like, patronage brokers, um, they 
they kind of assume that importance because of their closeness to the queen rather than because of a, a kind of an image that they might have created for themselves because ultimately it's the queen's um, decision. And what you would do if you were seeking you know, patronage, if you're seeking a, a sort of a job, say as, as a lady in waiting, you would try and contact, or, or perhaps your parents are usually, more usually, would try and contact as many of these kind of patronage brokers, as many of these people close to Elizabeth as they could, so they had multiple people speaking um, on their behalf. Um, and they might do this either by talking to them, sending them gifts, because that sort of sets up a, a relationship of kind of reciprocity and an obligation. When Shakespeare did go to court with some of his plays and perform them there, was this an honor being given to Shakespeare or was it a political test? I think about his plays that do have these political issues going on in them. Would Shakespeare have been being evaluated more stringently at court than he would be in the playhouse for the same play? Um, that's an interesting question. I think, um, I think we today tend to put an emphasis on the, the playwright, the author, the artist as being the, the sort of person um, sort of in charge of the, the kind of content and the, the sort of output. Um, but really um, the, the real kind of mover and shaker is always the patron. Um, so for instance, someone like um, the Earl of Leicester and the entertainments um, that get put on at the Inns of Court, such as Gorbaduck, and then actually transfer to the Royal Court. Um, so really it's more of, not quite a test of those patrons, um, but if, if there is, if there is going to be any um, fallout, it might be th them that receives it rather than um, the, the kind of playwright. Which would make sense because when Richard II was performed as part of the Essex Rebellion, it wasn't Shakespeare's playing company that got in trouble for that. It was Essex who had commanded the play. So that makes that part make a lot more sense. Yeah, exactly. I know we would love to learn more about court life in Elizabethan and Jacobean England. What are some of your favorite books or resources you can recommend we use to learn more? Um, so um, I've got three to suggest. Um, so the first of them is called The Elizabethan World, and it's edited um, by two superb um, Elizabethan historians who are also friends of mine, um, Sue Doran and Norman Jones. And that's a super book because it's just it's just full of really recent articles by a whole range of historians, literary scholars, etc., which just tells you so much about I'm surprised, the Elizabethan world. So it's not just about politics and literature; it's about all sorts of things. Um, perhaps a, a sort of a similar book, um, but with a slightly different sort of chronology. Um, I'd also recommend Malcolm Smuts's um, The Oxford Handbook of the Age of Shakespeare. Um, it's similar to the Elizabethan world, but it, it goes into the early 17th century, as does Shakespeare. And then finally, um, I would also recommend um, one of the recent books by my former supervisor, John Guy, uh, which is his book, Elizabeth, The Forgotten Years, um, which focuses on the 1590s um, and gives a kind of darker picture um, to the final years of sort of supposed Gloriana. Um, and that's, that's a really super book as well. Those are excellent resources. Thank you for suggesting them. We will link to these books as well as to Natalie's work in the show notes for today's episode. So make sure you stop by there to see those. Natalie, we ask everyone this next question here at That Shakespeare Life, and that's what's the one book you would take with you on a deserted island? My friends in England tell me I'm supposed to allow you the complete works of Shakespeare and a copy of the Bible. So your choice would be in addition to those. 
Yes, you have to um, allow for those because it comes from Desert Island Discs um, uh, where they have to choose about eight or ten records. Um, records, that makes me sound so old. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I have been... Uh, this is the one question I don't think I can answer. I, I just feel so stuck because I'm taking it far too seriously and thinking, but I'm only allowed one book and I read so that's not going to be good enough. Um, I had so, I had someone pick an iPad once for that same conundrum. Oh, yeah, yeah. Can I can I have my Kindle, please? Yes, <laughs> yes you I, can. I, I was, um, I mean, I've got sort of favourite books. So I, I love the Portuguese writer Jose Saramago. Um, and he's got two great books called Blindness and Seeing, uh, which actually kind of quite apposite for the moment um, on pandemic and COVID. Um, I also love W.J. Sebold's um, Austerlitz, which is an entire book written in one paragraph. Um, wow. But actually, it's not English, as difficult English to read English professors as you everywhere are weeping. <laughs> I know. Weeping. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, to be honest, I spend most of my time when I'm not reading history now just reading golden age crime novels from the 19 sort of 30s, 40s and 50s. Which so are wonderful. Yes. I'm coming with you to your deserted island. Yeah. Yeah. Come along. <laughs> come on and bring your Kindle as well. I will. I will. <laughs> So what's next for you? What do you work on now that you're excited about? I am so excited about my um, latest book, which I've only just started. Um, it's sort of working title is Exploding Elizabeth, partly because it might begin with the story that Elizabeth's corpse allegedly exploded um, in Westminster Abbey before she was um, buried. But really what it's about is it's, been influenced by the Me Too and Black Lives Matter movements. And um, what it does is explores the, the narratives that have been written about Elizabeth since her death, but focusing on those narratives which were not written by white, educated, elite Protestant men, but were written by women, by people from the LGBTQ um, uh, community, um, and, and also where actually they have not been written and where we're still kind of catching up, particularly in terms of Black Lives Matter. And it's partly about um, publicizing those kinds of stories, but also demonstrating how central they have been to the more orthodox narrative, but they have been sort of ignored or silenced because they're not written by the right kind of people. So a number of important Victorian female biographers, um, but you know they're not important because they're women and they're biographers. They're not kind of academic historians. Um, so it, it's and I'm I'm doing all I'm looking at graphic novels, uh, video games, um, which I don't play. So that's going to be kind of quite challenging. Um, so I'm just phenomenally you'll, excited um, uh, about it. And I'm you'll, loving have doing to, my research. You'll have to rent a high schooler for your video game uh, I, I, I exploration. Will. <laughs> I, I will. <laughs> well, this, this sounds exciting. I am looking forward to seeing your book come together. Thank you so much, Natalie Mears, for being here this week and taking us into the world of Elizabethan court life. I know I know so much more about it now, and I appreciate you sharing this history with us today. Thank you ever so much, Cassidy. I've really um, enjoyed chatting um, about it. I just, I could ramble on about Elizabeth for ages. <laughs> Be sure to stop by the show notes for today's episode, where you'll find even more history, including archival images, paintings, and reading recommendations. You can connect with Natalie, find out more about her work, and see even more history for today's topic. Explore the full show notes at CassidyCash.com slash episode 168. That's CassidyCash.com slash EP168. Don't forget that the video version of our show today is available inside the digital streaming app for That Shakespeare Life. Our digital streaming app features a whole host of hundreds of Shakespeare videos just waiting for you. There's documentary shorts, animated plays, archaeological site footage, bonus interviews, virtual tours, and more. Make sure you go there to find all of this extra video content at CassidyCash.com app. That's CassidyCash.com A-P-P.
I hope you've enjoyed our show today. And if you love the history you're learning about here, then you will really love our membership area. The membership arm of that Shakespeare life is called Experience Shakespeare. And we offer now two types of hands-on history bundles. We have digital history activity kits that work like science labs for Shakespeare history, along with complete lesson packs that feature detailed history guides, worksheets, coloring pages, writing prompts, and classroom suggestions. Each history bundle we offer coordinates with the podcast and also also with Shakespeare's plays. So you can easily bring the history you learn about on our show into your classroom or theater room. Or you can just enjoy getting to learn Shakespeare history the hands-on way with our library of recipes, games, and crafts you can do at home that comes straight from the 16th century, all designed to let you learn something new about the bard. Find out more and join today at CassidyCash.com slash join the club. That's CassidyCash.com slash join dash the dash club. I'll see you inside. That's it for this week. Thank you for being here. I'm Cassidy Cash, and I hope you learn something new about the Bard. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.